So, today Intel launched its 14th gen Raptor Lake Refresh products for the same price and often same performance as the previous generation. Indeed, while Intel did technically make some gains here with the 14900K over the 13900K, they are minuscule when you're not talking about applications that are artificially enhanced more than their previous generation. No joke, I was warned by Contact that Intel had some new optimizations they were preparing to take the gaming crown a few months ago, but I never got enough details to really feel comfortable talking much about them, and now I'm glad that I never did. Because basically today, we are learning that, at least when it comes to the 14900K, Intel has launched something that really can't gain much performance unless you are doing those artificial optimizations for the new gen and not the old one. And that's because the last gen for being honest, already pulled the power consumption level so hard that there's not that much more performance they can squeeze out of the top end chip, even with DLVR in better binning. And I mentioned DLVR because in case you forgot, it's been a feature of the new Raptor Lake refresh generation that's been long leaked by this channel, and I believe other people as well, that Intel had something enabled for voltage regulation in 14th gen Raptor Lake products that they never really got working in their last gen products in time for launch. Uh, basically, DLVR allows for less voltage to often be used at the same clocks uh, than otherwise, which if you think about it, if you can get less voltage at the same clocks as before, that means then you can up the clock speeds a little bit higher at the same power consumption levels. And theoretically, you should get more performance if you're not getting more efficiency. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the 14900K is such an unideal product at the thermal throttling it's already hitting that, well, if you look at Cinebench multi-threading benchmarks here conducted by Hardware and Boxed, you can see that the new i7 does get a higher score than the previous gen i7, and it's high enough that it can't just be explained by those extra four little cores, especially when you also look at the i5 that is getting a slightly higher score than the last gen i5 while simultaneously using less energy. That's DLVR right there, people. You have the new i5 with the same core counts as the old one, getting less power consumption and higher performance. DLVR is working here in Raptor Lake Refresh in the products that aren't already at their thermal limits. And the 13900K hit 10 nanometers thermal limits for the die size it has. And therefore, the 14900K isn't able to really gain that much. It's just tapped out. There's no headroom left in the top end for Intel's flagships. And you can find that in games too, where you'll see Intel really hasn't gained any performance in the top end with their new flagship over the old one. And while Intel wanted to take the gaming crown back, I am sure that's what their goal was with the 14900K. They just haven't. It seems that AMD is going to keep the gaming crown this gen, and they're basically just still trading blows and multi-threading, while the Intel counterparts to AMD are consuming significantly more energy. So, yeah, I guess that's most of what I have to say about what Raptor Lake Refresh brings to the table with its barely new technology and often no new performance. Let me get to a summary of what I think of the three products that came out today, piece by piece. First of all, starting with the i9-14900K, it sucks. It hasn't taken the gaming crown back, and its predecessor already was extremely overextended thermally, and so there's not much room here today for the 14900K to really improve on it at all, and it's not really worth talking about. Now, the i7-14700K, that's a different story, at least in the short term, in my opinion. I already liked the 13700K from the previous generation a lot. In fact, I own one. It's right over here in my benchmarking station. I recommended the 13700K last gen at the right price, and I think I can continue to recommend the 14700K at the right price once again, especially at its new price of $420. Uh, it does offer much better multi-threading performance than its direct gaming priced competitor, the 7800X3D, while well, giving you about the same gaming performance. So if you're somebody that's doing half gaming and half multi-threading with your PC, then I can see a good argument for getting the 14700K today over some of the stuff that was out just a week ago before it launched. Uh, it is, in fact, so close to the previous-gen flagships and multi-threading performance that I, I would even go as far as to say that 
lacking 16 E cores, you know, because the i7 14700K has 12 E cores versus the 16 and the i9. I don't even really see that as a downside because removing those four E cores allows the i7 to not quite be as insane thermally. I think it's a notable good trade-off. However, I will say though, I think the i7 makes sense if you're doing at least half or mostly multi-threading apps with it, and then the other half or less than half is gaming. If you're doing even 60% of gaming, like 60% of the purpose of buying the CPU is gaming, I, I still don't think you should get the i7 because the 7800X3D can often be found for 20% less now, and that does make it cheaper. And while you're gaming, if you're gaming most of the time with this, not using it for multi-threading apps, most of the time, you're going to be saving even more money by consuming significantly less energy, and it'll just be a more pleasant system to use. So you better be using it for multi-threading and have somewhat of a budget here. If you do, that's when you get the i7. Now, the i5, just like last gen, I basically see the i5 as the budget creator CPU. But that's all it is. Let's be clear here. It's really only 10% better than the R5 7600 that you can get for $100 less and it comes with a cooler and uses a lot less energy. So if you are strictly gaming on a budget, the 7600 or if you have an AM4 system, a 5800X3D, that's just going to be cheaper and more efficient anyways. Or again, if you just spend an extra $20 over that i5, you could get the 7800X3D, which is a chart topping gaming processor that will use less energy too so again the i5 is bookended by two processors that are either better price performance for gaming and cheaper or they are just better for almost the same price but much worse at multi-threading you get the i5 for multi-threading primarily i think if you're on an extreme budget but you want something new and it's therefore kind of a similar argument to why you would get the i7 14700k over the amd stuff around it except i kind of like the i7 more because it actually does trade blows with the 7800 x3d in gaming while offering significantly better multi-threading performance and therefore i think it stands out a bit more all right, so I would say I'm already through the general analysis part of this video that addresses the three CPUs Intel's launch today. You've heard my opinions on them. Now I want to get to something that I feel is a bit more important here, and that's addressing a criticism I've seen, well, just about every reviewer today leverage at Intel, and that's complaining that Intel should have just dropped prices on the existing generation and not bothered doing a new one, and it all comes off as desperate. And yes, it does come off as desperate, but it's because Intel is desperate. You see, Intel cannot afford to drop prices on 13th gen much more. I, I don't know if everybody here has been paying attention to Intel's earnings. They're already operating with razor thin margins. Intel's 10 nanometer node is not a cheap node to make products on. And these aren't small dies they're manufacturing here with Raptor Lake. In fact, I've already covered in numerous videos that every retailer I've talked to says that like half of Raptor Lake CPUs, they don't make any money on them. Intel's basically forcing them to sell them at cost. And then people at like a micro center are hoping you'll buy a motherboard with it. And people usually do, to be fair. So that's why retailers put up with it. But no, Intel cannot afford to drop prices across the board in a meaningful way with Raptor Lake. They're already losing too much money on this generation and so their solution was to drive up performance as much as they can and that's how they'll increase price performance but now there's a second thing going on here that's really even more around the word desperate you see oems want intel to launch a new generation every year so they can say they have a new generation in their products and i really don't know if everybody's getting this through their heads here intel has nothing to compete with Zen 5 for probably at least a year. I've covered this in a video about a week ago where I talked about how very late, very late next year is when Arrow Lake 8 plus 16 launches, and then a year after that is when the 8 plus 32 core model launches. Until then, all Intel has is Raptor Lake on desktop, and so they had to do something, anything, to try to get performance crowns back so they could claim they won performance this year Well, they get clobbered all next year. And in fact, since that video was put out by this channel, new leaks have been emerging online that back up a lot of details in that video. Like, for example, that Lunar Lake is a low-power 
generation for laptop, kind of analogous to Lakefield. It's not some desktop generation. And the same goes for Panther Lake, meaning that not only is Raptor Lake all Intel has to compete with Zen 5 for about a year, but that they're not going to have anything but Arrow Lake still to compete with Zen 6. And I'm getting a bit concerned about Intel, well, especially because I have new info about Zen 5, including diagrams and new code names for these products. And I want to leak that all to you today and discuss further about what we need to look out for if Intel is going to be able to compete with AMD on desktop any more really over the next few years, but first an ad from a sponsor. This piece of content is brought to you by Wondershare Recoverit. Wondershare Recoverit is a professional data recovery tool with 35 patents that can completely recover deleted and lost files, videos, and photos from any disaster. It's an all-scenario data recovery tool that allows you to recover data from a variety of data loss scenarios, such as accidental deletion, uh, formatting, device corruption, virus attack, or any other unknown error code. It is very easy to use and supports one-click recovery of videos and picture files, and the pair of unplayable videos as well which let me tell you there have been broken silicon recordings in the past where only a part of a guest video was corrupted but it prevented me from watching more than like a minute of the video and in the past i had to actually jump through a few hoops to find a backup cloud recording and if that wouldn't have worked i would have been in a lot of trouble if I had Wondershare recover it at the time, that could have just fixed the file and I wouldn't have been in any trouble. Get the link below and try Wondershare recover it for free. Clicking on this link below supports Moore's Law is Dead and it helps you try a great data recovery tool for free as well. Support the channel and support your ability to recover your precious data with Wondershare recover it today. All right, so AMD Zen 5. You know, it's funny. I can't help but think that a lot of the people out there who I can tell are clearly just guessing at Zen 5 specs and performance, not speaking from a place of informed authority, that they're guessing that Zen 5 will be some mythical, never-before-seen-in-history performance uplift simply because they're misreading AMD's confidence behind the scenes. They see that AMD's confident about Zen 5, and they think, well, then this must be the biggest IPC uplift since Excavator to Zen 1. That's not really what I think is going on here with AMD's confidence. The reason I believe AMD is so confident about Zen 5, despite having a reasonable, but still big, something worth getting excited about, as I showed in a recent leak, but a reasonable, not a mythical IPC uplift, is that AMD is about to turn their old weaknesses against Intel into strengths and have a key, few key features that are really good that Intel just cannot respond to in time. Like, for example, they're going to have 512-bit data paths for AVX 512 workloads, while Raptor Lake can't even run AVX 512. That's a huge weakness for Raptor Lake. doesn't mean all apps will have some, like, 40% or 50% win by AMD, but there could be some that do have that because of what AMD is bringing to the table. Well, Intel basically just continues to sell Alder Lake for a third time. That's basically all Raptor Lake Refresh is, a third generation of Alder Lake, and yeah, AMD knows they're going to have another solid increase in performance with a few key strengths that Intel can't compete with while well, upping efficiency and Intel doesn't have a generation to compete with it. That is why I think AMD is so confident. They know that Intel has already maxed out their thermal limit right now and they basically have nothing that is going to beat them and already they're losing before AMD brings this new generation. But anyways, I want to get to the new AMD information here. I've been dancing around it. Let me put this slide on screen right here. Now, I'm not going to show everything from the documentation I've received in the past couple of weeks regarding AMD's Zen 5 products, although I will show you a diagram of what they look like. But I will show you snippets. I just don't think it's safe to show this full set of documentation. But I will show you this because I think it importantly proves once again that Zen 5 is keeping 1 megabyte of L2 per core and 32 megabytes of L3 per CCD. So there's no need for people out there to guess the cache levels. Here it is. I'm showing you proof from AMD internal documents. And it also further confirms something that I've leaked, but now it's just plainly shown to you. Zen 5 standard with Epic will go up to 16 8-core CCDs, and the Zen 5C variant will have 
12 times 16 core CCDs. And now if I put this diagram on screen too, at least on the diagrams, this is how it seems like they are organized. As you can see, I've taken these diagrams and remade them here just like I did with that exclusive Sienna leak. Now the reason I bring up that Sienna leak isn't just a brag, it's to remind you that this diagram eventually was presented like this to the public. It looks very similar, but of course it'll look slightly different. And then the final product looked like like this. So remember, these diagrams are made to get the architectural ideas across and tell you the general layout, but the exact spacing and size of the dies, it's not one to one here. That's not what this diagram's for. Sienna diagram did roughly line up with how it was organized, but the, again, the spacing and size of the chiplets was a little different. But now from this diagram, you do roughly know what to expect out of Turin products. AMD will have an IO die in the middle. Seemingly the same IO die will be shared between the dense and non-dense flavors once again. And both of them will use a new generation of CXL and Infinity Fabric. And then of course the non-dense, the standard Zen 5 Turin, that will have eight CCDs on both sides of the IO die, and then the dense variant will have six CCDs on both sides of the IO die. And actually, I do need to say this here. I have now had two sources suggest to me that Bergamo's successor may be something called Sonaro, which I only doubt this because I don't know what this name is. I can't really find it on a map when I search. And also, I've already leaked something called Sorano, which is an Italian city. So I'm not sure if there's a game of telephone going on here, but I have had two of my best sources separately as of this week say Sonaro. So I have to get it out there and say that is possibly what the Bergamo successor is called. If not, I don't know, maybe they're just using Serrano for two versions of the, you know, the big SP5 and the SP and the SP6 variant. I'm not entirely sure, but again, there's Serrano that's already been leaked by me. And now I have two people saying Sonaro, maybe what the Bergamo successor is. So I want to say it in case there. Uh, oh, and another thing to clarify, that asterisk by the DDR5 speed, yeah, it's also present on, if I put this on screen now, a description part of the slide that confirms support for a whopping nine terabytes of RAM for Turin, which is just insane. But yeah, that asterisk is there next to the 6000 to denote that technically they are still validating two 6000 speeds, and they may even get higher than that, and they do think they will at least get to 6000, but but technically 5,600 is what is currently 100% validated. Now, I do think they'll hit 6,000. I don't think they would be showing this on the slide now. And this actually lines up with something that I had previously leaked that people at AMD and including in documents they showed me were that they were sure they were going to hit 5,600 and they're trying to get as high as 7,200. It sounds like they haven't gotten to 7,200 yet, but they're almost to 6,000. So here's fingers crossed they'll get higher because this is important to gamers. You know, they're already achieving a 20% higher speed, you know, DDR5 6000 with Turin instead of DDR5 4800 with Genoa, that suggests that they should maybe get to 20% higher speeds on desktop than they have now, and they're already near 8000 support on Zen 4, so if they get 20% higher than that, yeah, look, Zen 5 is going to run really fast DDR5 just fine, people. Although, speaking of old leaks, earlier this year, I leaked a roadmap that suggested Zen 5C should be produced around the same time as Zen 5. And despite that, I may have some bad news to report today. So if I put this slide back on screen that has some clarifications at the bottom there, you see, this week a couple of AMD sources told me that while Turin should still launch in early 2024, Turin AI may not be available outside of for specific customers now. And the dense version, that's the version that uses the Zen 5C, maybe the Sonaro one, that may end up launching next to the Vcash model in late 2024 instead of early 2024, which that's not 100% confirmed. It's just been suggested that may end up happening. If it does, it's a bit puzzling to me because I haven't heard that Zen 5C is really having any issues. But, you know, I do suspect I know what's going on here. Bergamo, the predecessor to Sonaro or Turin Dense, has barely even launched yet. And as far as I am hearing, AMD isn't worried at all about the 128 core variant of Zen 5, demolishing Intel's Granite Rapids, and even beating the Sierra Force 144 core and possibly even the 288 core. Remember that Sierra Forest will go up to 288 only little cores that don't have hyper threading. 
I think a 256 thread Zen 5, that's the standard Zen 5, not even the dense one, that may be decent competition for Sierra Forest anyways. And most of my contacts don't even think the 288 core model of Sierra Forest will be ready until late next year. So, so yeah, think about it. AMD is still ramping Zen 4C Bergamo right now, and they can't supply enough of them. It's selling well. And then they think Turin Dense isn't even really required to beat Sierra Forest. I think there's a chance that they may launch the dense version of Turin later simply because they want to milk Zen 4 a little bit longer. And they also, though, want to avoid overextending themselves by launching too many server products at the same time. There's something I constantly hear from people I talk to that AMD wants to get better lead times than what they have to better compete with Intel, be able to ship products quicker when people order them. And they could more easily do that if they just launch Turin with 128 cores first, get everything sorted with logistics, and then wait a bit to launch the dense variant. But also, hopefully, that means that AMD is still planning to start producing the 3 nanometer Zen 5C chiplets where they already were intending to, which is to say starting production at the very end of this year already. And instead of rushing out Turin Dense, Maybe AMD is planning to actually use some of those early Zen 5C yields to make a 24 core 8960X3D, you know, the model that I leaked they could launch a couple months ago. Uh, seriously, it wouldn't surprise me if AMD is right now planning to still manufacture Zen 5C right next to Zen 5 at the same time, and they're just not rushing out the server variant because they don't need to, they don't want to overextend themselves, and then they're just going to stockpile the best yields for the Sonaro launch or whatever it's going to be called later in the year, and then they'll send the bad yields to AM5 early to make 8 plus 12 and 8 plus 16 core models early. At least I hope so. And if it's not one of those things, then I don't know, maybe AMD is having issues with TSMC 3 nanometer, but I can't say that quite yet. And I somewhat doubt they are, but we can't entirely rule that out. We always have to account for a bad reasoning for why something might happen. And we'll certainly find out within six months anyways. But either way, whether AMD has a 16 core or a 24 core model with V cache cores ready early next year, it doesn't matter. I'm sure AMD is going to have Zen 5 shipping at least half a year before Arrow Lake launches. And so Arrow Lake better be pretty damn good to be able to make a splash after AMD has been clobbering them for a bunch of months before it even launches. And, you know, I do want to touch on this, though, about Arrow Lake. Look, to this day, I have nothing to change about my recent Arrow Lake leaks when it comes to the performance I expect. I expect Arrow Lake to bring a huge uplift over Raptor Lake, and I just haven't seen anything from my sources that suggests Arrow Lake is some small 5-20% to uplift, like a few other people seem to be claiming out there right now. Uh, what I would suggest is if someone out there has decent information, or, or should I say legit information, that they're looking at projections that are either based on outdated prototypes or maybe potentially of the intel 20a variant you know not the high performant tsmc variant Re remember intel always planned to have arrow lake predominantly using tsmc 3 nanometer and from what i've heard recently that 20a variant that they've announced already that was only added later once they were confident that their nodes were starting to catch up to tsmc originally they didn't really plan to have any intel produced versions of arrow lake they're adding that because intel's foundries are getting back on track but even then the 20a variant that's meant for i5s and budget laptops that's not going to be the highest performance models so that's all i can really suggest about some of the negative stuff out there although you know i'll say if i end up being wrong or intel m ends up massively missing what their projections were for arrow lake then i don't know it's going to be a complete disaster because if arrow lake isn't at least in around 30 percent single threading uplift and around a 40 percent mixed workload uplift over raptor lake it's losing hyperthreading, and that would make me suggest that, well, remember how I've been comparing Intel's 14th gen to Comet Lake that was clobbered by Zen 3, just like I think Raptor Lake Refresh is about to be clobbered by Zen 5? That would make 15th gen possibly Rocket Lake if Arrow Lake isn't good, because just like Rocket Lake, it would be launching something that's a little better in single-threading 
well, losing some multi-threading performance. And uh, I don't think that's what's going to happen, but Intel better hope that's not what's going to happen because if that is what Arrow Lake is, that's all they've got for another two years too. So, ugh. But you know what? I will let you know if that's going to happen in an upcoming video. That's going to do it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to subscribe to the Moore's Law Z YouTube channel to ring the bell button, tell your friends about this, like the video, and, you know, consider supporting Moore's Law Z on Patreon. If you join right now, you still have time to submit questions for Hogue of the Hogue Law Firm. He's going to be coming on to talk about the Microsoft Activision deal, NVIDIA being raided in France, and a bunch of other legal subjects as they relate to gaming hardware. And also you'll get access to a new die shrink coming out this week that's talking to modders that are working to bring PSVR2 support to PC. No ads, only for patrons. So that's there if you have the extra money. Only $2 a month gets you access to both of those pieces of content. And for everybody else, no matter what, thank you for watching.